In the positions that I held before coming to Georgetown, I began to see some common factors that were very challenging for communities to work with. And those were generally around multi-systems work, around how do systems come together and, in a sense, behave differently in order to benefit the children and youth and families they were serving who are present in those multiple systems. I wanted to develop a place that people could come to for fair, accurate, research-based, data-driven information that would help them develop the very best policies and practices for their own local communities. A few years back, there was a youth who was intentionally assaulting staff so he could go to DOC, Department of Corrections. Some of his buddies were in Department of Corrections and he felt like by going there he could be part of that group. He was a kid who was committed to us through the adult court. So we had the ability to send him. When you ask these kids what's most important to you, the very first thing that they say is respect. What they're really yearning for is connection to a bigger circle of belonging and ultimately to just feel that they're okay. And I think all of us struggle with that, this sense of really feeling comfortable in our own skin. When we looked at the data, we realized that sending him to the Department of Corrections would actually increase his probability of committing future crimes. I had to sit down with staff, and I had to explain to them why we were not sending this kid to adult corrections, and it was a very difficult thing to do. Finally, through family engagement, we convinced the youth that going to DOC was not the best option for him. We transferred him to a different facility, and he did really well. Ultimately, he became the leader of a youth firefighting crew that we have. Later, he came back he apologized, and he actually earned the respect of the staff here. If we want to change the world of juvenile corrections, we have to fundamentally shift the way that we look at the system. The question is, how do we get there? We engage in a lot of activities at the center, but there are three current activities that are the core of what we do. The crossover youth practice model, the youth in custody practice model, and the series of certificate programs we run on an annual basis. These are the programs that reach the vast majority of individuals who have contact with our center. They're the ones that, that probe and go deepest in terms of policy and practice change, and they're ones that we think have the greatest chance for impact and changing outcomes for disadvantaged children, youth, and families. I was working with other leaders concerned about the tremendous disproportionality for kids of color involved with my department. It seemed so overwhelming and it had so many different facets, but with no idea of how to try to even start to address the problems. I think I was pretty heavily influenced from a very young age. My dad was a social worker and he did different things involving child welfare. And my father sometimes would tell stories and sometimes he would express sadness. And I think that helped at a young age to instill a sense of empathy and a sense of you owe it to the world to try to do something positive and give back. Now that I have my son, I think about all the challenges some of these kids have to deal with that are involved in our juvenile justice system. Seeing firsthand the disparities and then thinking about what if this was my child? One of the things I've said to my leadership team is our standard is would this be good enough if it was my own child? That has to be the question that we ask in every single thing we do, every decision that we make. So many kids of color in our country are experiencing the system in a way that doesn't provide them equity and opportunity. We were grappling with that in my county. 
And then I saw this email announcement from Georgetown about the certificate program on reducing racial and ethnic disparities. And I went to various colleagues that I worked with from different disciplines, and I said, I think going to the certificate program would be a tremendous opportunity to learn together. We're all directors, chief executive officers, presiding judge of juvenile court, people who were very, very busy, but were willing to say, we will show up, we will spend a week rolling up our sleeves together, and then we will promise that we will come back and we will do what we said we would do. So we flew together, we got to Georgetown. I remember folks saying, wow, look at this. The certificate program was a mix of experts in the field doing presentations, but they also had a lot of interactive aspects of it, having group dinners, which is really where a lot of the rich conversations happen and opportunities to talk about, hey, that concept that came up today, what do you think about that? Or what's been your experience with that? And I think to really affect systemic change, you have to have those conversations. When we first developed the certificate program, we had to think hard about what is it about a certificate program that will lead to meaningful change. So in a sense, we needed to develop a theory of change that was effective. The idea of bringing a team of people to Georgetown for a week-long period of study in itself is meaningful. So we decided to strengthen it. How can we build upon that? So we added to our theory of change the idea of a capstone project, that they would take that learning that took place at Georgetown and then pick some dimension of that issue, some focus that they realized was something they needed to work on back in their home community. And then we work with them for that year-long period of time to implement that capstone project to move forward with the change. For our capstone, we examined what services are available to youth who are starting to dip their toe into the water of getting into trouble. We came up with this concept of some sort of early intervention program where we could divert kids from being referred to the juvenile justice system. And when we came home from Georgetown within uh, two weeks, we convened everybody together and started rolling up our sleeves saying, okay, we learned all of this and we need to fill in this action plan. About 10 to 11 months after participating in the certificate program, we had secured that funding and created a previously unavailable opportunity for kids in Multnomah County to have. This has been an incredible part of the journey for us at the Center for Juvenile and Justice Reform, from the West Coast in Oregon to the East Coast down in Florida, to the Northeast in New York and to the Southwest all the way down in Arizona. We've had teams come in with these incredible leaders committed and finding a way to make it work for the young people that they serve. Another good example of how to maximize the tools that we have available at the Center is what we experienced with Sacramento County. They came to our certificate program on multi-systems integration. They came with a strong team that cut across systems, had all the right players at the table who could effectuate change back home, and then went back home and said, we're not only gonna take advantage of that certificate program in terms of doing our capstone project, but also we're gonna do the full implementation of the crossover youth practice model. within the juvenile court. It hasn't traditionally been the experience to share information, to see the other side, or whether or not there's another side to the story. With the guidance from the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform, we had the opportunity to bring all of our parties together, our district attorney, our public defender, our child's counsel, our parents' counsel, our court-appointed special advocates, our educators, our family and youth advocates, our peer support groups, all of these different people to the table, and it sounds like a lot, and it is. The Crossover Youth Practice Model was really about a redefining of collaboration. The Crossover Youth Practice Model was developed almost at the very beginning of the existence of the center. It was derived from a series of piloting projects that we did in seven states. And then we sat down and said, can we actually construct a practice model 
that will guide policy and practice, that addresses the characteristics that we know are associated with kids who are involved in multiple systems, and in a way that would interrupt the trajectory that they have headed into those systems. Too often there are labels that are put on children. They are abused or neglected, or they're alleged delinquents, or they are alleged commercially sexually exploited children. And there's a single label, but there isn't a single approach. So I've got it pulled up, so I've got it in front of me. No matter what division you sit in, judges have the opportunity and the power to convene. I love that, that's great. One of the things I love about having judges as perhaps the most important leader at the table is that they have this authority, they have this power that they carry with them each and every day on the bench. But when they serve as this convener, they're just one of the partners around the table. So the most effective judicial leader in this setting is one that simply says, there's knowledge I have that I can share, but there's a lot of knowledge around the table that others need to share as well. And then the most powerful judicial voice is one that also acknowledges the fact that young people and families who are part of that broader group also have the authentic voice that needs to be listened to. And for a judge to be able to send the clear message to the entire implementation team that youth and families know their lives best and they can help guide us as we are bringing our expertise to the table to make decisions. As I reflect back on my investiture, if I were able to tell myself then some of the things that I know now, it's to be open-minded. One of the ways that we are able to do that, I think, is underscored by practices like the crossover youth practice model. Having a more holistic, multidisciplinary approach to serving all that makes up a child and a family, not just a single allegation, not just a single snapshot in time, but really looking cross-system and across the entire spectrum of the family to see what's needed. There are so many different books and articles about the system with great ideas that are sitting in libraries and shelves and PDF documents, etc. None of those things really matter unless they're put into practice. And that is one of the main focus of Center for Juvenile Justice Reform. How do we take the best research that has been completed and how do we actually make it happen on the ground? When I was contacted about being a co-author for the Youth in Custody Practice Model, I thought it was a great idea to have a document that guides the system around best practices. One of the reasons why we decided to develop the Youth in Custody Practice Model was there had been much talk in the country about the need to depopulate residential programs, to serve more kids effectively in the community, but we also saw the fact that there would still be many youth going into placement. There are many dimensions to the model, but there are two basic tenets. One was how do we develop a set of practices and policies that are best supportive of the staff who work in those facilities? It's a challenging population. The more serious offenders, higher levels of needs go into those residential placements and many systems are not prepared well to deal with it. And two is how do we develop a more developmental approach in working with young people who are in residential placement after disposition. The majority of the staff who come to work here come to help and come to do good work. But then depending on what the environment is, if they're coming to work scared for their safety every day, it changes their mindset. You can't just ask a staff to do something differently. We have to provide them the training, the tools, and the resources that they need to do the work. And that is precisely where the role of leadership comes in. If we can cite examples of other systems, or if we can share data from the existing practices that we have, then they'll ultimately begin to believe. They have to see that it actually works. The fact is that the brain is still developing up to age 25 or perhaps after. Generally, as a country, I think we can do much better. Rather than approaching the youth as a victim or a villain, looking at the youth as incredible, beautiful human beings that could become contributing members of their communities. 
if you can begin to really weave that into the culture that we're creating, as well as into the mindset of the youth, and then support them when they return back to the community, we can really begin to plant the seeds of a new future, not only for the youth, but for the communities that they go back into. My challenge, and the challenge of my staff, is to think about how to take that information that we have about effective practice and make sure that those individual case files in hundreds and hundreds of communities around the country are impacted by sound policy and practice and then for it to be institutionalized. When the center was formed, I was really thinking about a very small body of work. What surprised me was the thirst for what we were doing. The vision for the future is pretty simple. We'll continue to grow it. Never converting our thinking to somehow we know better here at Georgetown than the field knows about what they need and then taking that information and continuing to grow new certificate programs, new practice models, continue to bring leaders in. It's all about changing systems, changing the way systems behave, changing the way workers do their work to be most effective in terms of getting better outcomes for those young people.